ago when I was young and charming as some of you may know I practiced baby farming now this is most alarming when she was young and charming she practiced baby farming how many years ago to tender babes I must one was of low condition the other upper crust a regular patrician now this is the position one was of low condition the other Bitter is my cup. However, those children are and not a creature knew it. However, could you do it? Someday, no doubt, you'll do it. Although no creature knew it. In time, each little wave. Forsook its foster mother, the well born babe was Rafe, your captain. Everything was fine between me and our Peter till that Christmas. He was 12, I remember. Suitable for boys aged 6 to 12. You know how some kids play with a new toy on Christmas Day and then just ignore it afterwards? My eldest Andrew, he was like that. If I've said to him once, I must have said a thousand times. If you're so bored, why don't you do your own work? But he'd just shrug and kick the cat. Andrew, come here, put this coat on. Andrew! But Peter was always different. He'd either like or leave from the word go. He was like that about his toys, his meals, his school friends, everything. Believe me, I've always counted myself lucky that he saw me in a favourable light. You can't swap and change when it comes down to offspring, can you? It wasn't that I minded that he didn't take to the Superman outfit. As I said, he had plenty of other things that he'd never bothered with. Like that stupid game where you have to build a sort of Heath Robinson affair to trap a plastic mouse. I could see why he didn't like that. I didn't like it myself. Anyway... That's beside the point. I said to my friend Ellen, I said, I think our Peter's about to go through his funny phase. And I was right. I didn't mind that. After all, a boy doesn't want to be tied to his mother's apron strings all his life, does he? But I did worry about our Peter. You see, our Andrew's been a right tearaway ever since his father up sticks and left. In and out of trouble, every two minutes was our Andrew. Ow! Peter, on the other hand, was different. Sensitive. Thoughtful. He used to help me with the washing up until he got too old for that sort of thing. I didn't begrudge him, of course. And our Andrew was always too busy getting into bother to worry about what was going on at home. But whatever it was, it just wasn't good enough. Now, I've always taken a pride in myself. 
It isn't that I think I'm better than people like Ellen, say. But when it comes down to it, there are some folks who eat the chips out of paper and there are those that put them on a plate. We've always appreciated that there are other sorts of behaviour and there's nothing wrong with them, nothing at all. But that doesn't mean that we've got to get down to that level, does it? My mother never smoked a cigarette in the street, nor would I. Actually, I don't smoke, but you know what I mean. So when our Peter started his criticisms, I was really taken aback. No, I'll be honest. I was more than that. I was hurt. Let's take music, for instance. Oh, hello, Ellen. I mean, I've always been a lover of decent music. Classical and such. That's what comes from being married to a man who never stopped playing that Dolly Parton woman. I've always gone for the more refined type myself. Swan Lake, pomp and circumstance, that sort of thing. <laughs> oh, I like anything, me. My mother was very fond of Gilbert and Sullivan. Oh, I don't like him. I remember taking the boys to the Mikado at the local cinema when they were kiddies. They made a film of it, you know. I kept our turns going on Gary Glitter till it were past 14. <laughs> He played that record over and over, bless him. So much that even I got a bit fed up with it eventually. I didn't stop him, of course. It was the sort of thing I knew he'd be interested in. He takes after me, you see. He was bound to have an ear for music because I have myself. He never touches Gilbert and Sullivan now. I offered to take him when the local society did Pirates of Penzance, but he seemed to think I was joking. Andrew used to say that our Peter was a poser. Well, the two of them never got on, and that's a fact. Andrew said I shouldn't have listened to Peter when he went on about the music. Take no notice, Mum, he said. You stick to your pericomo. I don't like pericomo, of course. But he wasn't to know that it was rather insulting to say that I do. But if you ignore what he actually said, you've got to admit that he had a point. But it wasn't just the music. It was everything. All right, I admit it. I like romantic novels. It's a form of escape for me. When you've done a day's work, you need something light to relax with, don't you? Of course I know, they're rubbish. As if I didn't. But Peter seems to think that if you read a particular sort of book, you don't know how badly written it is. I caught him a few times with an Agatha Christie, more than once in the past. I never said anything, of course. I thought, let him get it out of his system. If I'd made an issue of it, he'd have gone and bought the lot of them and never touched his dickens again. I knew how to handle him, you see. I knew from the beginning he was going somewhere. He needed nurturing to appreciate that life was more than just beer and dominoes at the local pub, like his father and brother seemed to think. At 16, he moved to London, which shows how right I was. He had confidence, you see. If he hadn't been so confident, and if he hadn't appreciated the finer qualities of life, God knows how he would have coped with all that trouble he had. When it all came out about Peter, I looked on it sensibly and I didn't panic. I knew he was the sort that was going to mix with the high flyers. And even though it was a slip, and it was regrettable, it was understandable. 
Andrew was very bitter about that business. He'd been done the year before for taking money out of the till where he worked, and he'd been clobbered good and proper. Why does he get off scot-free, he said. I explained to him that he, as he chose to call him, had not got off scot-free. Peter was not the type to forget about being involved with such things. Like I say, he's sensitive. The scars of that time are probably still with him. Andrew needed a good hiding before he'd so much as blink at you. It's no good him keep going on about it only being five quid that he pinched. He had to be taught that you can't take what isn't your own. He's forgotten about it now, never mentions it. When I do, he just laughs. Say anything to Peter about drugs and he'll snap your head off. He's learned, you see, and the other hasn't. That's my point. And that's the difference between them. I remember when they were kiddies. Andrew would always be the one you had to wallop. I never had to touch our Peter. There was once I went out and came back and found them melting chewing gum all over the hearth. They were sticking it on, watching it sizzle. What's going on, baby? Come on, you tell me all about it. It wasn't my idea, it weren't. Did you get our Peter into this? Did you? Ow! Did you? Ow! Why is it always me? What about him? Don't you use that tone with me, young man. Ow! Maybe if I'd done that more often, our Andrew might have made something of himself instead of ending up in a council house on Cedar side. And I don't like to think about what he's doing for his work. It isn't what anybody would call a decent job, that's for sure. A quiet talking to. That's all our Peter needed to see that he'd done wrong. And I knew he wouldn't do it again, no matter what the other ones said to him. But whatever trouble I've had from Andrew, I will say this. You always know where you stand. He was like his father as a kid. He's like his father now, married twice in the pub every night. And I don't think either of them have ever even heard the word culture. But it's all I expected from them. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that Peter's fallen short of my expectations. Far from it. If anything, he's surpassed them. Good job. Nice car. A place of his own in London. No, I've always been very proud of him. But I feel left out somehow. When I think... It did all start when he was still at school. came home and announced that he wanted elocution lessons. I thought, oh my God, what's he got himself into now? I had to run round to Ellen's and check it out in the dictionary. I didn't mind, of course. I mean, it's good to speak proper English. But I did wish he didn't have to practice it all round the house. The teacher told him to do that, apparently. It familiarises them with the open vowels or something. 
Because to bomb did those lessons. And what good did they do me? It was after that I stopped being his mum and became mother. Oh, mother, he said. You're not going to wear that house coat. It's such a vulgar pink. It was like that about everything. I redecorated the living room because of him. White all over. It looked like an outside lavatory. Even our Andrew commented on it. But little Lord Fontleroy wasn't satisfied. Oh, mother. You're not going to hang those dreadful pictures back up on the wall, are you? I wouldn't have minded. But it was him who'd given me those pictures for Mother's Days and such like. That was when he was my little boy before I lost him. I do. I feel like I've lost him. Flashy car and talking funny and treating me like I was dirt. I thought when he became a success I'd be there with him. I used to dream of him becoming famous and someone writing his life story and maybe I'd be in it. Maybe even have it dedicated to me. <laughs> Silly, I know. But you think these things when you're on your own. Looking at him now, I doubt he'd even give me a mention. He seems that ashamed of where he's from and who he is under all them posh clothes. I met one of his friends once. Uh, this is Martin, Mother. We can't stop long. We've got to be in Blackpool by six. Well, just you watch him, love. You wouldn't believe the trouble I had getting him in for a car when he was little. He was always sick going to Blackpool. Oh, don't be so snooty, Peter. Us mums are allowed to say things like that, aren't we, Martin? Peter rang that evening to say that I was never, on any account, to speak like that again. I said the poor chap looked like he needed cheering up. He didn't mind my being familiar. Of course, I know what the problem was, really. Our Peter was ashamed of me, wasn't he? Ashamed of his own mother. We patched it up, of course, and he carried on with his monthly visits. I never saw Martin again. I suppose our Peter must have fired him. It was a couple of months ago that this recent trouble started. I'd just finished my shopping and I bumped into Ellen on the street here. I said she was overreacting. She does. 
She thinks if it's in the paper, it has to be true. I calmed her down as best I could, but she wouldn't have any of it. I said they can't just chuck us out of our homes. They have an obligation. Oh, yes, they can, she said. They find you alternative accommodation. Well, when it comes out, it transpires that they offer you one of those awful, pokey little places on the edge of town. Well, I thank goodness our Peter's done as well as he has. I didn't think I'd ever be put in this position, but at least he's got the room. Oh, right. <clears throat> Would you and Peter not mind? Well, there's nothing much you can do about it, is there? I mean, I'm going to be left without a roof over my head. There's nowhere else I could go. I'm damn sure he wouldn't want me to end my days in a noddy house. Do you know, I'm almost glad they're building this motorway. It might be a blessing in disguise. Oh, aye. I can see. He'll be glad of the excuse to go, I can bet. Right. I thought maybe she was right. I'm not saying that either of them owe me anything. They're grown men now. But I did think our Peter might remember what I'd done for him. It wasn't easy. And it was because of my scrimping and saving that he's able to be high and mighty now that I need him. He knows that me and Andrew are like chalk and cheese. Our Andrew's turned out a nice enough fellow, I suppose. But he's got no taste of anything. And at my time of life, there are certain things that you don't wish to be reminded of every day. He says he doesn't bring it home with him. I said I should think not indeed. I can't quite ignore it. I mean, I can smell it on him. Oh, I don't want to live with our Andrew on that estate. I don't. I mean, it's not my fault they're building a motorway through my house. You'd think it was all my fault to hear our Peter talk. Inconvenient, he says. Does he think I chose this time? to be thrust out on the street without a bloody penny? I'm sorry, I'm getting upset. Our oh, Andrew's got a nice little house, I suppose. I'll make the best of it. Maybe I should be grateful to him. At least I'll be able to cash in my post office money. When my time comes, I'll be going free of charge. 